Boa noite. Ele trabalha na fronteira entre a economia e a matemática e ganhou o mais importante prêmio mundial por criar um método que permite tratar matematicamente o comportamento social e econômico das pessoas. Através desse método, ele analisa e estuda o mercado de trabalho, verifica a tomada de decisões e as escolhas que as pessoas fazem na vida e transforma tudo isso em fórmulas que permitem analisar e entender melhor os fatos econômicos e a própria atividade da economia. No centro do Roda Viva esta noite, o economista americano James Heckman, professor da Universidade de Chicago e prêmio Nobel de Economia do ano 2000. Para entrevistar o economista James Heckman, nós convidamos Cleide Silva, repórter de economia do jornal Estado de São Paulo, Fábio Santos, editor da revista Primeira Leitura, Ricardo Paz de Barros, diretor de estudos sociais do IPEA, Instituto de Pesquisa Econômica Aplicada, especialista em pobreza e distribuição de renda, Getúlio Bittencourt, diretor de redação do DCI e do site Panorama Brasil, Amália Safatli, editora da revista Carta Capital, e a Luiz Araújo, professor da Fundação Getúlio Vargas e do Instituto de Matemática Pura Aplicada e editor científico do Encontro Latino-Americano de Econometria, que trouxe vários economistas acadêmicos de renome internacional para o Brasil recentemente. O Roda Viva é transmitido em rede nacional para todos os estados brasileiros e também para Brasília. Infelizmente, neste programa você não pode mandar a sua pergunta porque ele está sendo gravado. Boa noite, professor. É possível... É, raciocinar é, diante da economia como se ela fosse uma ciência ou como é, buscando o maior rigor científico quando a gente vive num mundo em que a decisão, por exemplo, de um executivo ou de um conselho de executivos de uma empresa altera completamente o balanço dessa empresa e por tabela todo o mercado econômico mundial? I think, uh... If I understand the question correctly, you're, you're asking about sort of the role of economic theory and the role of economics in explaining real-world phenomena, yeah. the phenomenon of how uh, we can explain this complicated behavior of human beings. And uh, I, I think it's clear that uh, in every detail of human behavior, we have no chance to explain. But there are many regularities that emerge when individuals interact in markets, when individuals uh, are, are raised by their families, uh, when firms are, are, are regulating workers, when uh, people go into markets and buy goods. So there's certain very general regularities that apply to aggregates uh, and to sub-aggregates, which are fairly regular. And so in that sense, I think economics has a real claim to being considered a, uh, a scientific study, especially because we uh, are open to suggestions, we're always open to testing theories and asking theories to conform to data and respect data and make predictions. So we're, we're subject to the possibility of uh, being refuted and that makes it a scientific activity. Sim, mas eu digo, eh, vou citar um exemplo um pouco mais eh, concreto. Eh... Ah, o desempenho econômico de uma nação ou, de, ou de, uma, de um setor econômico, ele é registrado, no caso das empresas de capital aberto, pelo balanço dessas empresas. Quer dizer, são essas as medições disponíveis para que se avalie a, a, a saúde de uma empresa, o desempenho de um setor econômico. Na hora em que é, os balanços das mais importantes empresas do planeta são é, contaminados pelo interesse imediato do lucro, e são burlados com é, a maior desfaçatez, isso não, digamos, não, não compromete, não digo a ciência econômica, que, enfim, não tem é, compromisso com isso, mas é, qualquer capacidade de avaliar esse mercado mais é, racionalmente? Well, if you're talking about the general issue of corporate governance and the issue of how companies uh, respond, I mean, there is an issue which is very much studied by economists, which has to do with the structure of, uh, of how uh, companies uh, are owned, uh, how they report to their shareholders, uh, and how disciplined they can be by the market. Mm -hmm. And so in countries around the world, not just the United States, uh, for example, if you look at the difficulties that were experienced recently in South Korea, where you had a substantial, uh, and are undergoing, countries, companies there are undergoing a substantial change in the, in the corporate governance structure, uh, that need for transparency, the need for accountability, uh, 
Uh, markets are, are not foolproof, and that's clear in the United States. But it's also the, c the case that if you do have more public accountability and auditing companies that are giving honest reports, that some of the worst excesses of companies can be inhibited and prevented. And I'm sure that as a result of the scandals that are happening in the U.S. now, that in the next generation, the next 10 years, the company records that will be produced and the public documents will become part of the larger, uh, much, much more factually informed. And I think shareholders, the mark, part of the reason why the market is declining, it has been declining anyway in the last few weeks in the United States, the stock market, has to do with the fact that the financial data on which investors are making decisions became questionable. Now, as that uh, uncertainty gets resolved, I think the market will punish certain firms, reward other firms, and there will be more of a standard for, uh, more of accountability standard than ever before. So I, don't, I think that it is a matter of economics, and I think it's a question of how you structure the governance of companies and how much accountability they have to their shareholders. O senhor tem dito em algumas entrevistas que a globalização é um fator positivo e que ele, ela pode trazer alguns problemas de curto prazo, mas a longo prazo é benéfico para a maioria dos países. Ah, eu queria saber se o senhor tem alguma ah, estimativa do que significa curto prazo ah, para os problemas que ah, podem ser vistos hoje. Uh, baseado num ponto que me parece interessante, que é, uh, desde que a globalização se acelerou no fim da década de 80, uh, as crises têm afetado países uh, menos desenvolvidos. Uh, o México primeiro, uh, depois uh, a os Rússia. tigres asiáticos, a Coreia, o Brasil. E uh, o, o tempo que durou essas crises foi relativamente pequeno, entre seis meses e dois anos. Dessa vez, porém, a crise está afetando o seu país, que é a maior economia do mundo. E, e é isso que eu gostaria de saber, se o senhor tem uma ideia do que, que curto prazo significa nesse contexto, agora que afetou os Estados Unidos. Well, uh, when, when, when economists talk about the long run, we're talking typically about decades. We're talking about comparing the economy uh, that would be experienced, say, uh, the economic growth that would be experienced in a, in a closed economy environment, uh, asking what happens when decade after decade that economy is shut off from the other world, the rest of the world, uh, asking how that performance would be compared to a uh, performance where that economy is open to trade, to ideas, to technology, to the import of capital goods and, and of people even. Um, so, yes, some of these cycles, some of these crises can take quite a while to work out. There's no doubt that, uh, for example, take a country, uh, a phenomenon that I studied uh, and I'm studying now quite a bit. Uh, uh, globalization, if you want, would, would be part of the phenomenon of uh, the incorporation of East Germany into West Germany. Uh, there you have a process that's going to take probably another 10 years to fully work its way out. There's no doubt about it that globalization uh, can hurt some people and can help other people. Um, but what is no doubt in question is that the overall level of productivity of the economy and the, some of the sources of economic growth and wealth creation will be fostered by opening markets, by opening competition. But there's also no doubt that in the short run people are severely hurt. So for example, in the East German context, in some of the Eastern European economies, which were cut out of the world economy for 50, 60 years, that you had uh, a substantial uh, harm imposed on workers, and for that matter, uh, managers, people who grew up under one regime that became economically obsolete. And so always in the problem, there always is a problem of reallocation, and it's not costless, and we know that. So any kind of social policy has to accommodate this problem of the transition. That some people, are take, uh, it takes quite a while, and we have to devise effective policies to ease the transition, because we can, we can improve the transition, or we can delay the transition, depending on economic policies. But we also must recognize that certain policies for the transition should not be permanent policies. So an example would be if you have workers who are unskilled by the new technology. You know, and this also happened in Argentina during the period of its boom, when Argentina was 
opening its capital markets, the price of capital fell 40, 50 percent, and uh, certain depends on how you measure the capital, in a very short period of, period of time. Uh, markets were opened. Uh, people trained under an old regime, the import substitution regime, became obsolete. Their skill levels were very low. It's very difficult to make them adapt to the new economy. So you have to think of creatively of how to adapt those people. So I think in the long run, when we talk about the children of these people, if you have an open society where people have choice and are given the opportunity to get skills, education, uh, entering uh, every level of society, that uh, increasing the wealth of society, as, as market forces uh, generally do, uh, can only help society. But you have to be careful about managing that transition. O senhor me sempre mencionou nessas uh, análises uh, a questão dos chamados insiders e dos outsiders. Quer dizer, quem está, digamos, nos processos que, que são beneficiados pela, pela globalização e aqueles que estão mais à margem. Não é, é mais... Não é mais complicado para quem está justamente fora do processo, quer dizer, como é o caso das populações da Argentina, do Brasil e de outros países, né? quer dizer, não é... aí nesse caso, os outsider fica o país inteiro ou não? Well, when I use the notion of insider outsider, I'm thinking of groups of people inside a country, mm -hmm. so that I'm thinking of uh, individuals who are. Uh, for example, in, uh, in, uh, in many countries, you have a protected enclave of workers uh, who are more or less kept away from any economic dislocation. Uh, for example, uh, whether it's in uh, Chile or whether it's in uh, Germany or Sweden or, for that matter, in Taiwan, if you have groups of individuals who are protected by either legislation or unionism, maybe both, those workers can typically uh, avoid some of the immediate location, dislocation costs. Uh, and, and by excluding people from that protected enclave, it's the people who are the excluded people who bear the shocks. So, for example, youth who don't get in to the, to the unions or the protected sector, minorities who may not get in, uh, individuals who are at a very high level of, uh, uh, sort of low level of skill, sorry, uh, may in fact be excluded from these protected sectors. In Argentina, the example would be given those who were protected by the, the Peronist unions uh, in, the, in the early 90s were able to avoid uh, some of the real ravages of unemployment that were affecting the economy from the mid-90s. So the insider-outsider distinction is something I meant more to say about uh, groups within an economy. I think Entire economies may be outsiders in some sense. I mean, if you imagined countries in West Africa that were primarily uh, dealing with uh, commodities that were like cocoa or, mm -hmm. or, or coffee that was uh, for export, and it, they, if there's a secular decline in their market, those economies are going to suffer a serious dislocation until resources are adequately moved from those products to some other products. And that can be quite a while. So there is a sense in which certain economies, the, the higher uh, wealth economies, the economies with more human capital and physical capital, do form a kind of club. But I think within each of those economies, there's an insider group and an outsider group. So when I use the term mm -hmm. in, the, in the paper I think you're referring to, I'm referring much more to the individuals within a society. And then we have very sharp differentials, you know, like 26% unemployment rates for some groups and 0% for others. And the protected groups do quite well, and the unprotected groups do quite poorly. And this is true in many countries around the world, OECD countries, less developed countries. Amalie. Uh, in uh, an interview that was two years ago, the Sr. affirmed that if the Brazil had the force of work without qualification technical, the globalization would take the country to the século XVIII or XIX, with the reduction of the life of the population. <laughs> Uh, o governo atual propagandeia que, que o ensino melhorou, é, agora em termos quantitativos com certeza, mas em termos qualitativos o, o ensino básico público é, se deteriorou bastante e, e o ensino superior ele, ele ficou extremamente elitizado. E ainda tem mais um problema com o desemprego, tem muito profissional liberal que é subutilizado.
É, por exemplo, ele é um engenheiro, mas ele não consegue emprego, trabalha como um auxiliar de escritório, alguma coisa assim. É, então, seguindo esse raciocínio, o senhor admitiria hoje que a globalização tem sido prejudicial para o padrão de vida da população brasileira? Well, I just came out of a session. I chaired a session in uh, the Econometric Society meetings where we could look at that question. Uh, and, and if you ask sort of what creates the fundamentals of wage inequality in Brazil and what creates the fundamentals of wage inequality in many countries around the world, it's what's sometimes called a race between supply and demand. Uh, a phenomenon is working around the world in terms of technologies are biased towards hiring skilled labor. Now, this varies in different countries, but in fact, in a paper presented at the Rio meetings of the, uh, that, where, which I attended two years ago in October of 2000, there was a paper that summarized data from many countries around the world, and many developing countries as well as developed countries, showing that the bias in the technology is towards using more skilled labor. So what that means is the newer technologies typically are, are richer, they're, they're actually using more trained people, people who are more highly educated and with better quality of schooling. So I think that fundamental force is operative. Now different economies respond in different ways. And to the extent that the supply of education is not increased, that leads to greater differentials and it means that people are not going to participate in the economy in the sort of general prosperity that's created by this new demand for skilled workers. So that economies that respond slowly the American economy actually is responding quite slowly to the uh, increase in demand for skilled labor. The Canadian economy is responding more quickly. Some other economies are responding. So partly it's a matter of educational policy, but the fundamental forces of technology are there. Now, whether you want to call the fundamental forces of technology just globalization, I'm not so sure. Globalization is a very vague term. It means many things. So the fact that technology is transferred across countries is part of the globalization process. The part that there's trade, which is part of this technology transfer, but also just trade in goods, even at a given level of technology. That's another aspect. But I think the general force is, is, is not so much just some vague concept of globalization as the notion that the demand for skilled factors of production has really increased dramatically. And it, so educational policy plays a huge role. So the policies made by the Brazilian government, the American government, the Canadian government have a big effect on what the wages are, what the adjustments are for various groups in society. So it is the case in the U.S., a country I know better than Brazil, really, uh, of course, and that is that certain groups in the American society have not participated in the new economy to the same extent as other groups have participated. And what that means, then, is that you're finding a growth in inequality across certain family types, so across certain ethnic uh, racial groups, uh, and leading to some kind of form of increase of inequality. So that in response to the skill bias technical change, there hasn't been a uniform increase. Unskilled workers, high school laborers, uh, people in the US context, people with less than uh, 12 years of school or 11 years of school in the Brazilian context, uh, less than a high school degree, have actually suffered real wage declines until recently. Professor, como o senhor disse, globalização é algo realmente muito complexo, mas uh, há um efeito que parece ser uh, pervasivo, parece ser uh, geral, não só entre países, mas, mas também dentro do pa de países, que é a desigualdade. Há um processo de aumento da desigualdade, inclusive entre esses insiders e outsiders que, que, que o senhor uh, se referiu numa questão anterior. Uh, eu queria saber se o senhor concorda que, de fato, há esse crescimento e, segundo, uh, se há como uh, intervir, se os estados nacionais e os governos têm como intervir para diminuir as causas dessa essa desigualdade ou as causas dessas desigualdades e também se, uh, se a metodologia que o senhor descobriu, ele uh, trabalha com ela, uh, se ela pode uh, facilitar a focalização das ações governamentais, porque o que a gente vê no Brasil é que há, de fato, um gasto social elevado, uh, se a gente considerar é, todos os gastos que o governo faz com essa área social, mas uh, os efeitos são quase uh, não visíveis, pelo menos, ou pelo menos pela população mais, mais pobre não consegue realmente sentir uh, a diminuição da diferença. 
entre as classes sociais? Well, I think you have to be careful. I, if I was just looking at statistics uh, presented to me by the education minister to, yesterday, uh, and uh, if you look at the improvement in educational standards, especially among uh, just participation in primary education across different income classes, it looks to me from the Brazilian data there's been a big expansion of sort of an intermediate group of, of, of individuals, people who are more than primary school, secondary school graduates. So that's been a major component that improves the quality of uh, the workforce and, and eliminates some of the gap. I mean, the major determinant, one of the major determinants of in earnings inequality around the world is education. That's been very well documented. Ricardo uh, Barros at the IPEA, numerous important studies uh, from that group, have shown a very important role of education. Those kinds of studies are found in other countries uh, around the world, that the importance of education is real, uh, and policies that essentially promote education and access to education have a fundamental way of reducing inequality. But inequality is a very difficult problem. It's not, the real question is how do you improve education? How do you improve access to education? And there I think we're just beginning to fully understand, I mean, we as a group of economists, the real factors that give rise to the what economists would call the supply of skills, who goes to college. But it's clear that factors that have to do with families, that have to do with environments that are in the early years of the child's life, as well as you know neighborhood effects, and, and schools, of course, are all quite important in producing. And re producing children who are educated to a high level, and even promoting the, uh, the access in the larger society. So a lot of the discussions that take place focus very narrowly on schooling. And schooling is extremely important, so it should focus on schooling. That's the major component, a major component. But we should also recognize in any discussion about inequality that we have a much larger, that skill is a major component. We're talking about inequality among people. We're talking primarily about labor market inequality. There's also, of course, capital markets, which can create be another source of inequality. But if you look at the inequality of skills, and you ask where are these skills produced, schools are a part of it, but it's not the whole part of it. Families are a very important part of it, and firms are as well. Firms training people, we know from many estimates around the world that if you look at job training, not just formal, explicit job training, but learning by doing, just the very act of work itself and creation is a major source of learning over the lifetime. So any kind of policy that we think about for a long-run reduction of inequality has to look at the family, has to look at schools, and has to look at the at firms as well in a more inclusive way, instead of just focusing exclusively on schools, although schools are quite important. So in that sense, I think uh, you know there are policies that can be very effective. There are a lot of policies that can be very ineffective as well. So if you have a bad policy, you know, waste money on education. Now, for example, in the United States, we have a very big debate now. A lot of the evidence in the United States says, and this is strictly a statement about the United States, that if you increase schooling quality in the United States and don't change the institutions, the way the money's spent, the incentives that teachers and students have, that the effects there are really very modest. In fact, if you do a careful cost-benefit calculation, the costs probably exceed the benefits in the U.S. Now, I'm not saying that's true in Brazil or true in other countries. There still is plenty of scope. Some studies by Hanischek and Harbison have shown that, at least in the northeast of Brazil, expanded quality had big effects in improving quality of uh, I mean, participation in schooling and, I think, longer-term effects. But nonetheless, you have to think more creatively. Education is a field which is not open enough in most countries to new ideas, responses, flexible responses, and incentives. So what economists have most to say about any problem is making, making people respond to, we know that people respond to incentives. And so incentivizing a system is a very important way. So recent studies done in, 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 uh, in, the, in the United States again, look at the effects, say, of competition among schools. And this isn't vouchers. This is a statement simply about letting school districts compete for students geographically decentralized school districts. School districts that face competition actually tend to perform better. They produce higher quality students. They produce them at a lower cost. So in many dimensions, 
So one has to be creative in thinking about incentives. It doesn't have to mean you privatize, but if you don't privatize, you need to create some of the incentive structures that would appear in private organizations. So I think there are a lot of social policies. I mean, typically you were mentioning expenditure on health, expenditures on these longer term items, but I wouldn't put health in the same category as, I mean, maybe child health, maybe nutrition, you know, early, early childhood development in a different category from health for the elderly, which is not going to actually have any sort of immediate productive effect. It's, it has very high social value, so I'm not denying it, but you don't expect to get a return in the same way you get a return on a dollar if you invested in a young child or a college student. So you want to think about these policies in somewhat different terms, you know, whether they are skill producing and fostering or whether or not, and it's those skill enhancing policies, those policies that prepare people for the modern economy and that remedy some of the deficits they may have experienced from their own families. Those policies are the ones that are likely to reduce inequality. Whereas, in, in, in certain other components of inequality, like access to health, but that's going to affect only one generation. You, you make a group of older people who are ill have better lives, and that can be a very important calculation. But what it means is it's less of a, less of a dynamic effect, less of a long-term effect. It's for those people at that time. When we're talking about education and, and, and skill formation, policies more generally, we're thinking about this generation and the, and the next generation because good parents, educated parents, make uh, better children. And so you actually can foster the wealth of society in a dynamic way. Uh, Mr. Heck, as you mentioned, really, the aumento of muito substancial que houve nas taxas de escolarização, tanto no primeiro grau, no segundo grau, verificado recentemente no Brasil. Mas, infelizmente, ficou toda uma geração é, com pouca educação e onde talvez exista ainda a possibilidade de se fazer alguma coisa em termos de educação de adultos jovens, pelo menos, mas, digamos, na faixa de 18 a 35, alguma coisa desse tipo. É, existe alguma experiência internacional que sugere que algum caminho para nós devemos seguir nesse, é, no dia de dia esse importante problema? Well, there is international experience, but it, it, it does suggest that certain kinds of retraining activities of older workers, training activities, can be productive. It's not a very good record so far, though. And the reason is that, uh, for example, if you look at the transition economies in Eastern Europe, where you had groups of people who were educated under one regime or not receiving full sets of modern skills, trying to be adapted to a new technology in a new market setting, the returns on that activity tended to be quite low. Now, part of the reason why these tended to be low was that the programs that were offered were short-term job training programs, programs that were typically of five, six, seven-week duration, maybe two months, maybe even three months but not long enough to really train people fundamentally in new skills and new ideas. And so if you take people who are in the 20s and 30s and give them what you think of as formal education, sort of a serious body of skills. Uh, in the United States, we think of this as community college education, uh, where a person learns fundamentally a new trade, how to fix computers or how actually to operate computers or word processing systems, nursing, a uh, number of practical skills. Those individuals can be educated, but it's a costly process. You're not going to get, you know, it's very, uh, the, the return, there's a, very, there's a very somber number, as you know, that economists uh, are sometimes called the, uh, the dismal scientists, not because the science is dismal, because the lessons tend to be very uh, dismal at times. But we know, for example, if you get a 10% return on an investment in training one of these older workers, so that you, you get basically, say, $1 more, Typically, to get a flow of one dollar more per year for the rest of the life of the individual, you're going to have to invest something like ten dollars in that person. So if you want to increase income by a thousand units of whatever currency, you're going to have to spend ten thousand dollars up front to get that. So cheap, low-cost programs aren't going to be very, you know, they may have a small effect. We know in the United States that if you teach people how to find a job, My, uh... you get a little bit of an effect. Mas no Brasil existem alguns estudos que, por exemplo, se fizer um treinamento mais formal, como você falou, não um treinamento curto, mas, por exemplo, de 
é, supletivo, é, na realidade, o retorno de educação tem sido quase comparável à educação de mais jovens. Né? Então, é uma, talvez seja um pouco diferente, porque justamente esse é um, esse, quando se faz uma educação mais formal, talvez seja esse o caso. Né, que talvez tá porque o nível dessa educação desses, dessas pessoas no Brasil, o nível de educação delas seja muito baixo e o supletivo realmente faz uma diferença muito grande. Não. O que você está dizendo é que essa educação muito curta não tem efeito. Talvez a educação de mais fundamental é, pode ser eficaz mesmo para right. adultos jovens. Sim. Né? Yes. Well, even among youngsters or like people late teenage years, but there certainly is a very good record of education that's based in the workplace. So, for example, if again, if a worker is not fully educated and maybe lacks math and science and, and basically even reading skills. Learning on the job, in the context of the job, can sometimes be very powerful. We have some examples in the United States of unskilled individuals. Certainly you could think of the German apprenticeship program and some of the apprenticeship programs that carefully relate work to learning do have some effects. If you look at the rates of return on those activities, they tend to be fairly high. So there, there are things you can do. The problem is, though, if you have very, very poorly educated workers, people who lack basic numeracy, basic literacy skills, it's a very, very expensive process to somehow bring these people up to, to, to a modern level. So it, it's, it's, an, it's expensive. It's expensive. And so I wouldn't expect a, some cheap return from such activities, some very high rate of return or very low cost. I mean, I believe that you can do something with people who are less educated. And I think you could, but everything we know says that the, you sort of more or less get what you pay for. If you get a cheap program that's not producing much, mm -hmm. Uh, that, or you're not going to get any miracles that come out of that. Maybe a few small miracles at a small scale, but you can't really change people fundamentally without incurring a lot of cost. And the other side of the coin is that the older a person is, now you were talking about 20 to 30 year old people, but when you start looking in the United States experience, we had programs, uh, substantial college education programs, or retraining skills programs for 45 year old steel workers. People who had lost their jobs, companies were not competitive in the 80s, so they were given retraining. You look at these, and many of the workers wouldn't even participate. You offered them full scholarships, you offered them even stipends for a living, because they did the calculation. Well, I'm 45. I can retire in 10, 15, 20 years. I can work in McDonald's. It's difficult for me to learn. Maybe it's a fact that as people get older, it's harder to learn. You've experienced this firsthand, no doubt. <laughs> no, but seriously, it's, it's a serious problem. And it, and it is, especially le since learning is a cumulative process, if you have a substantially unskilled person, 45 or 50 years old, you might teach that person to read and write. But it's harder. It's much harder than teaching a child. And uh, there's psychological evidence for that, too. So it's not, it's, and, but we know that, uh, that workers, when they're given the opportunity, won't even take them. So in that sense, you really have to deal with this question, which bothers me a lot, of people in their 40s and their 50s uh, who are not that well educated. Very difficult to imagine making them, raising them to the level of full certification of somebody who's in high school. So then you have to think of policies that maybe are more creative, that keep these people in the economy, but maybe not a skill program, a program that essentially focuses on their skills, that essentially says, well, maybe you want to attach them in some other way to the economy some kind of transfer, some kind of subsidies. But to think that you can educate people at low cost to, to high performance is a very, I wish it were true. I have no, no happiness over that. That's the dismal part of the dismal science. The, uh, something, uh, uh, something for nothing is a rare event in economics. And in this particular case, in the economics of skills, it's very, very problematic. The evidence is not so good. But still, there are some, there's some scope and where companies can come in. In, in. in the U.S., in the 1970s, we had a group of uh, German and Swiss companies entered South, South Carolina, which was at that time a very undeveloped area. The typical education level of the workers, the potential workers in this area, were like eight, nine, ten years of school. Uh, these people were basically uh, textile workers in very low-skilled jobs. Uh, chemical companies that come in, they want a much higher skills. So in, co in cooperation with local community colleges, colleges that were working with the companies, teaching people skills, some of the workers, the younger ones, admittedly, yeah, the ones... Yeah, I was talking about... I was talking about the younger ones, the younger ones. Yeah, exactly. 
the, the younger ones, up to 25, 30, 35, those people participated, and those programs are really quite effective. They were subsidized in part by governments. Companies worked very well. They taught them systems. And so you developed an educated workforce. In fact, what had been a backwater of American society by the late 70s and early 80s, 80s had become one of the leading industrial districts in the United States with a much more highly skilled workforce. So it's not impossible, but it's still a relatively young task. Learning is, is better done when you're young. If you, <laughs> if you have the illiterates, 60-year-old illiterates, you hear people who graduated college who are illiterate at 60, but those are rarities. And Ricardo. Yeah, voltando um pouco aqui à questão da globalização, que nós já comentamos que a, a globalização é deve ter um impacto benéfico no longo prazo, mas que pode ter um custo elevado no curto prazo. Tem uma outra questão sobre a globalização que parece ter também um consenso é, mundial, que é a questão de que esse custo de, de curto prazo é, depende dramaticamente da, da regulamentação que você tem no mercado de trabalho e depende dramaticamente da rede de proteção social que você tem é, implantada. Ou seja, esse custo não é exógeno, não é dado. Ele depende das instituições de cada país. É, existe uma grande discussão no Brasil se o mercado de trabalho brasileiro, se a, regula se a regulamentação do mercado de trabalho brasileiro e os programas é, é, de proteção social no Brasil são adequados para lidar com essa abertura comercial. Quer dizer, se ele não for adequado, ele simplesmente vai gerar um, curto de, um, um custo de curto prazo que vai ser muito elevado. O ideal, imagino eu, seria nós termos um mercado ao mesmo tempo, uma regulamentação que permitisse um mercado ao mesmo tempo flexível, que permitisse o ajuste e ao mesmo tempo que tivesse uma proteção que é, é, permitisse é, 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 proteger aqueles que fossem é, atingidos pelo, a, pelo, pela globalização. A questão que eu queria colocar é, é se o senhor poderia é, descrever rapidamente... É, idealmente, que tipo de mercado de trabalho, um, idealmente, um país deveria ter? Ou que tipo de regulamentação, que tipo de sindicatos, que tipo de programas sociais um país deveria ter, de tal maneira que ele pudesse enfrentar da maneira, da maneira melhor possível e se beneficiar o mais rápido possível desses ganhos da globalização? Bom, eu tenho estudado essa pergunta há muito tempo. É uma pergunta muito importante. Question. Uh, and the question is, what are the institutions that facilitate uh, economic development, adaptation to the new economy, the world economy, and at the same time um, protect the individuals in the society? And uh, you mentioned trade unions, so let me start with trade unions as an example. Many people think of the trade union as, as being the arch enemy of progress. And I don't think that's true. I don't think the record says that unionism, per se, is harmful or helpful. I think what we do know is that decentralized unions, unions that essentially are responsive to individual incentives, to workplace incentives, they may protect the worker in the workplace. They may provide a kind of legal protection, but also that are based on local fundamentals. So, for, for example, company-based or sort of narrowly regionally-based unions that are essentially engaged in facilitating the work production process can actually be a major source, positive source of transformation, protecting workers against some extreme uncertainty and at the same time facilitating technical change. So, for example, in England, we studied well, what was the effect of the deunionization that went on, and what happened uh, in the green fields movement where new companies appeared. It wasn't so much that unions were, were inhibiting productivity, it was a kind of centralized unionism that used a political process to redistribute and to sort of interfere with the economic fundamentals to, to protect a group of, a, a, a protected enclave of workers. That tended to slow down the adjustment process, and that's the kind of unionism that England got rid of. But on the other hand, in studied in the U.S. and in certainly England and other countries where it's been studied, a decentralized unionism that's adaptive to the local incentives, that is interested in trying to protect jobs for the workers, not just trying to protect a whole cluster of workers and, and play a part of, like I would say, the Peronist unions in Argentina are the extreme example. 
of the latter, kind of highly centralized unions that were interested in particular protecting one group of, in the society against the other groups. So I think that one wants to be very careful about the institutions of, uh, of adjustment. Uh, you know, you look at some of the economies in East Asia, for example, South Korea and uh, uh, Taiwan in particular have been very successful. Hong Kong in its heyday and Singapore. Uh, you'll notice that those economies that have been generally quite successful have not had very much of a social welfare state. In fact, people have argued that sort of a lot of the disincentives that were built into the social welfare state were, um, uh, uh, were avoided. Uh, on the other hand, that, lead to a, that would lead to a, a form of inequality, a greater form of inequality. So that's the classic trade-off, really, between saying, well, do we want institutions that protect people, but protect people against change, and maybe even prevent the change, or do we want institutions that facilitate the change? And I think the institutions that are more decentralized, like the trade union situation, or for that matter, job regulation. Well, we studied that collectively in some IEDB projects, and uh, you participated in that study. And we do know that if we have, um, uh, the general finding is, is that if we have too much rigidity in the labor force, too much difficulty, then in periods of transition, what happens is that adjustments won't be made so quickly. The cost, I think, there is sometimes the statement is made about more equality or less equality, social protection. But the one finding that came out from many of the studies in the IDB project and other studies around the world, in Italy and uh, other countries, has been that the social protection that is put in place by job regulation is somewhat unequal. And there's where you get to the insider-outsider issue that we were talking about before. That if you protect a group of people who get tenure, more or less, inside the sector, and they themselves can't be fired so easily. They're not going to form the, they're not going to bear the brunt of any adjustment. It's the rest of society that typically bears the brunt of that adjustment. And so in that sense, I think it's a difficult question. Now, in an economy like Brazil, uh, where you have a uh, very serious, uh, uh, you know, have a lot of unskilled individuals still in the larger society, the question is how comprehensive can a social welfare program be? And then what the opportunity cost of funds would be of providing some greater insurance against, say, improving the education or making some other structural reforms that essentially will make Brazil more competitive in the future and maybe reduce inequality. But the, the, the great problem is to try to get mechanisms that reduce risk but without reducing incentives. And a lot of the institutions in Northern Europe have essentially reduced incentives, I think, substantially. So the German context is one that I was mentioning. The replacement rate on Social Security, uh, unemployment, is very, very high, which means that the possibility of staying unemployed for long periods of time is great. So if you look at the composition of unemployment in not just Germany, but many other countries in Europe, where they do have social protection, there's a real choice that people have to make, which is not to work. And so it protects individuals in a short-run sense, but it also reduces incentives to acquire skills, to take other jobs, even to leave the country or to move to other parts of the country to pursue economic opportunities. And I think there's some evidence that those adjustments, retarding that adjustment, was certainly not going to be helpful for the longer run, but it certainly helps the people who are benefited. So that's the kind of calculation I think that has to be made. Great. Yes. Professor, a gente estava falando dessa questão de acesso à educação e aí tem o um outro lado que é o também acesso ao trabalho. A gente tem muita gente que tem a qualificação suficiente, muitos jovens que não conseguem o primeiro emprego. A gente, o Brasil hoje tem cerca de 11 milhões de desempregados, muitos deles jovens que não têm acesso a esse primeiro emprego. E aí tem todas essas políticas para se discutir a geração de empregos. Existe no Senado que está parado o, a discussão de um projeto para flexibilização da das leis trabalhistas no Brasil e a maior central sindical do Brasil, inclusive, é contra isso porque acha que pode retirar direitos já conquistados pelos trabalhadores. E tem hoje também discussão, é, hoje o candidato que está na frente nas eleições, na, nas pesquisas para a presidência, ele defende, por exemplo, redução da jornada de trabalho para hoje uma média de 44 horas para 40 horas semanais, porque ele acha que pode gerar empregos. Os outros candidatos também estão defendendo, por exemplo, é, o aumento do salário mínimo, que hoje no Brasil é de 200 reais, é, menos de 70 dólares. 
O senhor acha que essas medidas efetivamente pode ajudar a criar emprego e, no caso do salário mínimo, pode ajudar a reduzir a pobreza no Brasil? Well, there's no question. Again, we were talking about insiders and outsiders. And there's no question that a certain amount of regulation, if you raise the minimum wages for people who keep their jobs, if you raise protection and you raise the standards, whatever it is, the, uh, an entry barrier to join a union or to join a sector, that the people who are in that sector who keep their jobs will be benefited from that move. There's no question about it. At the same time, it does tend to create exactly the kind of problem that seems to be being discussed here. And that is that it excludes individuals who don't get into the sector. You know, if you raise costs, the typical study, and labor demand, so-called labor demand study and around the world, suggests that if you increase the price of labor, everything else the same, you hire fewer laborers. Now, the real issue is how quantitatively important that is. In the U.S., we've seen studies of the increase in the minimum wage that have suggested that small increases in the minimum wage don't have much of an effect on employment. They still have a negative effect. A recent paper by Steve Machen uh, at the University College London, uh, looking at what was called home care studies in Britain, showed substantial disemployment effects of the minimum wage that was brought in under the uh, Blair New Deal. Uh, on home care workers. These are nursing home workers, workers uh, home for the elderly. And there you got a very substantial reduction in, in demand. So a lot of the evidence around the world, in Puerto Rico, in the United States, uh, at one time extended the minimum wage legislation to Puerto Rico. And when that study is carefully, when that, that experiment was carefully examined, the policy experiment was examined, it led to substantial disemployment of workers because they became more expensive. The wages in Puerto Rico were way below the American wages. Suddenly, the American minimum wage is extended, and you have substantial disemployment. So when the wages are substantial, when the wage increase is substantial, you get substantial disemployment effects. So I don't think policies that essentially promote um, uh, reducing employment are going to do much good for people who are at the fringes of society, the people who are the marginal workers. What would be a more effective policy, I think, would be to have a more skilled workforce to train these unskilled uh, individuals and maybe to increase the incentives for firms to hire. So you might ask, well, what are, what are alternative sub policies? Well, subsidies, for example, for employment. Maybe if you look more broadly about uh, the whole regulation of industry, taxation, payroll taxation, other kinds of regulations on firms, regulations, you know, even taxation of capital. If you think more broadly about the sources of how society, of, of wealth creation in society, we know that firms are a major component. If you, if, you, if you give the right incentives to firms, more firms, more capital creates more jobs. So it, you have to think more broadly than just immediately about a policy that may affect some workers positively, like a minimum wage, and some workers negatively by keeping them out. You might think about more broadly about other kinds of policies that would make the business environment more competitive, that would essentially allow firms to uh, hire more labor and, and want to hire more labor, even at the same fixed wage. You know, if you reduce taxation on capital, if somehow it became cheaper to import capital into Brazil, more capital produced demands more jobs. You know, firms take, buy capital, capital equipment, hire workers to work the capital equipment. So the economic fundamentals suggest there are a broad range of incentive options, taxation options, deregulation options, options that would create incentives everywhere in the society to promote job creation. I think those would be more promising. But it, politically, I mean, when you think about the problem of employment, most people immediately think about minimum wages, because you know, here's, here's the labor markets that we should work directly in the labor market. But economics teaches us to think more subtly. We should really realize that how we treat firms affects how the labor market demands workers and how wages are set. How we train workers and potential workers will affect the way that firms will be hiring these workers. So it's an interaction of both these factors that give incentives to firms and the incentives to individuals to acquire skills and to participate in the economy. So I would argue, on, based on very general principles, without
specific knowledge of the Brazilian context that, they, that factors that promote incentives are going to be much more effective than factors that somehow reduce or raise the price of labor or maybe help some but hurt others. Professor, o senhor deve ter notado que ah, nós perguntamos muito ao senhor se ah, o Estado pode fazer isso, se o regulamento do Estado pode mudar dessa ou daquela maneira. E o senhor responde ah, frequentemente dizendo que as firmas deviam ser ah, liberadas para fazer isso, para fazer... Ah, então, que a gente tem uma, um foco talvez muito voltado para o Estado e o senhor vem de um país onde o mercado é que resolve frequentemente. Uh, mas nós estamos aqui numa situação especial, esse é um ano de uh, sucessão presidencial e eu pergunto se o senhor tem curiosidade por isso, porque é, é a quarta vez que nós temos um líder sindical disputando a presidência da república uh, no Brasil. Uh, isso não é incomum em outros países, é, nós vimos na Europa, na Polônia com resultados duvidosos, a Inglaterra teve algum, uh, acho que a Nova Zelândia, Austrália, desculpe. A Holanda, recentemente. Ah, mas isso o surpreende e ah, o fato de termos um, um líder sindical com 40, 48% dos votos. E o senhor teme que isso possa trazer ah, mais ah, regulamentação no mercado de trabalho ah, ou as experiências que ah, ocorreram na Europa e na Oceânia dão esperança de que um líder sindical possa desregulamentar mais o mercado e criar oportunidades de trabalho. Well, there's a phenomenon called uh, the Nixon in China phenomenon, which I think uh, is what you're referring to. And, and that is that a trade union member, a uh, leader uh, who has uh, the trade unionist in his pocket, can probably abuse his, <laughs> uh, uh, worry less about trade unionists than somebody else can. And so it tends to proceed more flexibly. You mentioned Poland. And that was certainly the case. I mean, uh, if you think about the way the Polish labor market was, was transformed. Now, it's true, the, the leader finally left office and there were further reforms. But the fact is that I don't see anything intrinsic one way or the other. I mean, if, if in, in, in Brazil, the situation is different than in Argentina. But I know that in the Argentine context, uh, for example, I think one real difficulty that Menem had in getting his reforms through was precisely that his traditional base was the labor unions. So if you looked at that immediate experience, so which seems maybe, I, I don't think the unions are quite as strong in Brazil as they are in Argentina, but uh, it, 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 Menem was not really able to produce a series of substantial reforms in the labor market, and it was precisely on political criterion. This was his base, and he would have eroded completely his political base. I think that was a serious mistake at the time. I think it would have been very helpful especially given the, some the corruption and the administration of union pensions and health benefits and other regulations that prevented, I think, employment growth and made it more costly to do business. I think it was just very, very difficult. So I would guess if you were to borrow from the experience of Menem, but I, it's not a general rule. I mean, we have not had a presidential candidate in the United States who ever came from a trade union, at least to my knowledge, not a large trade union. We certainly have had public officials who've worked very, uh, been had trained union activities, and uh, to the extent that they're going back to their home base, they've probably shifted uh, again towards protecting the, the existing electorate. And then we go back to this discussion we had earlier about insiders and outsiders, and there I would argue, based on a lot of readings, uh, the historical reading, that it's probably going to be some strong incentive for him to protect his base. In which case, then one would think there might be a move. Less, less, less possibility of reform, less possibility of adaptation. But on the other hand, you could have the Nixon in China phenomenon, so I want to rule it out. Let's hope for the better. <laughs> yes. Eu queria. É, o problema. É, o Brasil está na seguinte situação: ele tem uma política social extremamente rica. É, basicamente, é impossível você imaginar um programa, um desenho de um programa que exista na Europa, nos Estados Unidos, que também não exista no Brasil. Então, o problema do Brasil hoje não é um problema de criar novas políticas. Nós já temos um leque amplo de políticas. Mas, é, ao contrário, talvez, de outros países, nós não temos nenhum sistema de avaliação do impacto dessas políticas. É, nós temos muito pouca tradição e não temos uma... É, instituição que seja responsável pela avaliação do impacto desses programas. 
O que eu estou querendo entender é qual a sua avaliação sobre a, a, quanto que o Brasil está perdendo com isso. É, porque é, isso depende de três fatores. Quer dizer, o primeiro fator que eu gostaria que o senhor comentasse era, é, de fato existe metodologias confiáveis para medir o impacto desses programas? Quer dizer, depois de tantos estudos, é, nós... É, nos países mais desenvolvidos. Acredita-se que nós sabemos qual é o impacto de um programa de treinamento profissional ou qual é o impacto de um programa de reforma agrária? Ou o Brasil não está perdendo muito em não fazer essas avaliações, porque, na verdade, esses, essas avaliações feitas em outros países são muito experimentais e que têm resultados é, é, duvidosos, etc. Dois, essas avaliações são excessivamente caras que é, é, seriam proibitivas para o Brasil? É, ou, é, dado a incerteza sobre os resultados, não valeria a pena fazer? Em terceiro lugar, será que nós não precisamos fazer avaliação porque o impacto de um programa de treinamento profissional na Holanda, se feito no Brasil, vai ser mais ou menos igual? Um, o impacto de um programa é, é, de educação infantil de um outro país, é, feito em Cuba, se importado para o Brasil, vai dar mais ou menos igual? É, ou seja... Será que os, esses programas sociais, o impacto é tão específico ao país que obriga a que o país tenha que fazer todos esses é, investimentos? Então, a, a pergunta basicamente é, existe uma metodologia confiável, ela é cara e ela precisa ser aplicada ao Brasil porque os, o impacto do Brasil pode ser completamente diferente em outros países? Porque vai ser difícil desenhar uma boa política social se nós não sabemos o que, que tem impacto e o que, que não tem impacto. I think uh, the United States has been very lucky. I think it was an accident that we were so, so lucky. And in some sense, during the period of the 1960s, uh, when, at a time when uh, President uh, Lyndon Johnson, or really Kennedy and Johnson, opened up a number of new social policies, uh, policies to alleviate poverty, uh, The origins of, of this movement are not clear to me, but it's clear that by the late 1960s, there was a very strong effort to try to evaluate whether these programs worked, how effective a whole variety of these policies were, job training policies, child care policies, policies to promote, um, uh, eliminate discrimination, and so forth and so on. Many, many policies that were put forward. And uh, in the United States, we made an investment in data sets, in methodology, and in techniques to uh, assimilate this information. And the goal of this was initially to say, to guide policy, specifically very narrow policy. Did this policy work? Did that policy not work? And to eliminate the political element of a lot of discussions. Many of these social policies are settled on, on polemics. People say, yes, you know, this is a right-wing or a left-wing affair. So if you look at what happened, though, for example, the whole question of welfare was very much in debate in the United States. We we're giving money to poor people. The question is, what were the uh, disincentive effects of these welfare programs? Did they cause these people to work much less? What were the consequences of poverty? The long-term consequences, for example, of having children grow up in welfare families. So starting in the late 60s and continuing to the present day, the United States built a, a database for monitoring these activities. To answer your second question, the database is not that expensive. It's considered an integral part of the American evaluation system. But what it's done is it's eliminated the politics out of a lot of social policy discussion. And the most dramatic example of this came in the 1990s, when, for example, uh, you had a Democratic president, President Clinton, pushing very actively for welfare reform, making statements that Republicans only would have made in the late 60s in opposition to Lyndon Johnson uh, and so forth, that Nixon claimed to be making. So what happened is this, this whole process of evaluation of social programs put out, changed the policy discussion from one being strictly political to one where actually facts could inform. So that groups of people who 30, 40 years ago, or at least institutions like Brookings Institution, the American Enterprise Institution, which used to be in opposite ends of the political spectrum, now have joint seminars and agree on many of the basic facts. There's still important sources of policy disagreement. There still are factual questions which aren't known and need to be known. But the 
information that's come from this kind of social assessment has been extremely valuable in informing American social policy. And it's meant then that we actually can educate people. So I'm a great believer in education. And how do you get a good education? You put facts out on the table. Facts that are not susceptible to manipulation. Facts that we can look at certain myths and say, well, are these, are, how important is this? For example, the job training literature in the United States. When I was talking to uh, Professor uh, Rougeau a minute ago, I was drawing on a body of studies that began in the 1960s, looking at the effect of public job training programs. It was a common belief in the early 1960s that we could use job training programs to miraculously transform unskilled workers. Well, after many years of evaluations, we found that these public programs have not been that effective. And it's widely accepted. A few cases, exception, and those few cases that have been successful have been kept. But many, and we, that, for example, changed in the 1990s in the United States. Again, President Clinton, a Democrat, uh, coming from the same party as Johnson and Kennedy that introduced these job training programs, fundamentally restructured the job training programs to prune them out. And there was a widespread consensus. It was no longer a matter of partisan debate. It was no longer Republican versus Democrat, conservative versus liberal. It became known these programs didn't work, these programs do work. So the act of evaluating social policy changes the political dynamic. And it means then that you can actually use human intelligence, human uh, knowledge, accumulated human knowledge, accumulated facts from your own program to, cho to choose policies, decide what's important. It's really quite, uh, and it's an underappreciated uh, benefit, I think, of American society that we actually have these ongoing evaluation schemes. It's not that we don't make a lot of mistakes, but we can learn from some of the worst ones anyway and uh, pursue some of the better policies. Professor Heckman. Eu tenho um defeito de fabricação que eu imagino que muitas pessoas no mundo têm, que é sempre que é, se aborda uma questão muito geral, eu procuro é, ver o que, que essa questão geral afeta a minha vida pessoal. E quando o senhor mencionava as questões da educação, a importância da educação e essa temática toda dos incluídos e dos excluídos, dos insiders e dos outsiders, eu sempre penso nos dois filhos mais novos que eu tenho, e um tem 12 anos e outro tem 16 anos. E explico. Eles é, têm todas as oportunidades que alguém na classe média brasileira pode oferecer para um jovem de educação. E, de modo geral, acham muito insuficientes essas oportunidades da escola convencional. E tem na frente deles, como também todos os jovens no Brasil desse setor da classe média, e imagino que nos Estados Unidos também, um computador que permite a eles ter um acesso a informações do mundo todo, a internet, enfim, todo esse mundo novo que nos é, fascina tanto. No entanto, é, esse mundo da internet e do computador, que provavelmente vai ser muito importante quando eles estiverem na, na vida econômica, não significa nenhum tipo de consumo para eles, salvo o acesso à internet e à energia elétrica que o computador fornece e os programas que eventualmente eles compram. Então, me fica uma dúvida enorme na cabeça, o que é que a sociedade está oferecendo para essa, para esse público mais jovem, que vai significar é, essa formação e essa educação que os economistas tanto mediram que ela é eficiente para se conseguir um bom emprego, para ter uma melhor condição de qualificação profissional, enfim, para ter uma vida econômica mais vantajosa. E só para... Complicar mais as coisas ainda, li recentemente aqui no Brasil é, uma notícia de que é, a MTV solicitou recentemente é, ou abriu vaga para VJs, apresentadores de programas de TV. E inscreveram-se 44 mil jovens do Brasil inteiro querendo ser os apresentadores do, de programa de televisão da MTV. Como é que todas essas soluções que a gente busca no plano da racionalidade, das políticas de governo, é, das soluções maiores da sociedade, tem a ver com a história de existirem 44 mil candidatos para uma emissora de televisão que passa música e entretenimento o tempo todo, ou o fato de que jovens que têm todas as oportunidades de estudar e de, enfim, ter a melhor escola possível, etc., acham muito mais interessante passar o tempo todo deles no computador e na internet e pouco a preço dão à educação formal. Well, it, you have to, I wouldn't view the internet uh, as a uh, necessary competitor to knowledge. I mean, a part of le learning is play. 
Uh, when you say that, the, I mean, you're, you're describing partly also an adolescent phenomenon, right? Uh, the visibility and the enjoyment of life that would come, uh, the publicity. And, the, and we do know, what we do know is that uh, even to a quite late age, in the teenage years, that uh, uh, there's a real role for uh, more, let me, let me put it uh, in a polite way, more, you know, some, some discipline, some um, direction because children are still learning, even at a fairly late age, uh, the skills of judgment and uh, skills of uh, balance. So a uh, question of social priority, I mean, you know, people of, uh, <laughs> years ago, a sociologist at the University of Chicago named Coleman wrote a book called The Adolescent Society, and he points out that the values in all of public schools in uh, the U.S., and this was in the 1950s, were very bad. So even the best schools, they all, they all adored the same rock stars and had the same values. And yet, miraculously, 10 years later, these people produced and became quite effective. Uh, so I, I don't see it as a, I mean, unless I'm really misunderstanding your question, I don't see this as, I mean, it's, you know, adolescents have a different culture. And uh, the question is, you want to make sure they're not permanently impaired by their judgments. But if they make their, uh, if you give them a chance. Uh, but I do think, though, the question, the more general question about uh, creating incentives in the society to perform is the really serious question. And I, there, I think you'd really want to ask how much of a, uh, and it's not all an economic question. It's a question of sort of what values are placed on the larger society for learning, for productivity. Are there very negative images, for example, for people who do creative work, whether it's art or in economics or in science? I mean, that's a question partly that, that's, that leaders can, uh, can help foster. And it's also something the educational system can foster. So I think those are creating and fostering those values. I mean, there's been a serious question in the United States, too, about whether or not the sort of values created for a younger generation provide the right kind of motivation to learn and to attach. So a lot of, by some, some measures, you know, uh, the U.S. is not uh, producing uh, the level of skill and achievement that it should be producing. And so you get some of the same questions raised. And, and I do think there is a role for kind of moral and cultural leadership that's usually not discussed in an open, open setting. It's used as kind of old-fashioned. I'm not suggesting any particular religious or, or social practice, but I do think that there are strong benefits from uh, uh, families and from incentives that sort of foster excellence, that, that, that reward it in some way or another. Competitions, achievement, and so forth. We have cultures in the United States where achievement is punished and that has serious consequences for its, its members. So turning it around when, when accomplishment is, uh, is rewarded, then it leads to real achievement, real creativity. Fábio. Professor, eu queria voltar para a questão de políticas públicas, mas uma que tem a ver também com a nossa vida pessoal de cada indivíduo no Brasil. É, o professor Ricardo Paz de Barro me confirmava no, 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 durante o intervalo que o Brasil gasta mais com os seus idosos do que gasta com os seus jovens, com suas crianças. De certa forma, ele poderia dizer que gasta-se muito com previdência social e é, não o bastante, não o suficiente com educação. É, no entanto, é, esse gasto com previdência social garante que uma importante camada dos nossos idosos sejam hoje, por exemplo, é, é, líderes, é, são, sejam as principais fontes de renda dos seus lares. Né? Ou seja, temos aqui um, um beco sem saída, bastante complicado de resolver no Brasil. Eu queria ouvi-lo um pouco a respeito dessa questão, é, além do que ela, politicamente, como lembrou Getúlio, estamos em anos de eleição, é, ela é muito importante, porque é, o país tem um limite consideravelmente estreito de recursos públicos para serem investidos e, de algum lugar, tem que sair o dinheiro para que se aumente os gastos uh, na educação, considerando que a nossa uh, uh, contribuição fiscal já é muito grande no Brasil. Uh, qual a sua opinião sobre esse dilema uh, que vive o país hoje? Well, I, I don't think there's any doubt that, I mean, you can understand the political economy, the situation you're describing. I mean, middle-aged and older people vote and participate in the political process, and five-year-old children don't. I mean, their parents do, but they're still... Um, somewhat of an imbalance, I would think, and especially minorities and people who come from more disadvantaged backgrounds are less likely to participate. But if you look at the return 
if you look at like a social return on a dollar, a social dollar invested in education versus health care, you're going to see a very huge payoff to education, to early enriched environments for children, even to uh, fostering skill production in the job. Much more so. I mean, that's why I was saying earlier in the, some remarks I made earlier in this uh, program, making the contrast between sort of this expenditure, which is redistributive, which maybe eases the life and helps the insurance burden. There's some role for that, no doubt about it. But there are other activities which have to be thought of as investments, where we literally, instead of just giving people money, it's, it, all of these cost money, but some actually yield money in the, down the road. So you have a more educated workforce. You have a more educated you know, a highly motivated group of young children, people uh, making up the disadvantages of, say, bad families or poor family backgrounds, that what you're going to have is productive workers who will actually enlarge the tax burden, uh, tax benefits, I should say, in the future, who will actually produce society. There'd be many fewer problems. We know, if you look at all the benefits of education, for example, even much of this is, is typically reduction in health care costs. So even some of the things you learn about being more educated is uh, things to avoid, certain risks to avoid, certain p problems to, uh, to avoid, and so forth and so on. So that if you do the full calculation of what a dollar spent on education is worth in terms of a long-run benefit, and you do the calculation of what a dollar, say, in insurance for the elderly is worth, well, they're, they're both are worth something. There's no question about it. But the fact of the matter is you get a much, much higher return on your educational dollar. Going back to the point that uh, 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 Ricardo Barros was raising earlier, that if you look at the evaluation of what the long-term benefits are of, these, of, of, of looking at the young versus the old, on any kind of cost-benefit calculation, you'll see huge unexplored benefits right now, benefits that can enhance the Brazilian society of the next generation. But it needs a longer horizon. I'm not saying you need a dictator. But I think you need to have a more informed public discussion where you recognize all the foregone benefits by, by siphoning money into some older people. Well, sir, that's fine. I mean, they, they make their lives more comfortable and you want to give dignity to everyone in society. But nonetheless, the opportunity cost, to use a term that economists use a lot, is the investment not made in the young, not made in the children, not made in the next generation. And that's ultimately the source of wealth of, uh, of any country, right? It's the skills of its people. And so protection, insurance is one thing, but investment's another. And the return on investment is high. In the long run, you're not going to be spending the money. You're going to be getting it back, and then some. Because you're going to get it back in more productive workers. You're going to get more productive, you know, revenues will come to the government. And the demands for social problems. A lot of the social problems that currently plague Brazilian society and other society tend to be diminished as the more educated population appears on the scene. So it has a huge benefit, and that it's just hard to see it. It's the kind of thing where it's so gradual. I mean, you know, a child grows each day. You see very little evidence of its height, but of course, in 20 years, you see enormous growth. You need that kind of perspective on educational investment. So immediately, you help the old age, the old age pension of some of some retired worker. That's an immediate benefit. It's very transparent. But the long-term consequences are well, not so. You know, the person's somewhat better off, but then. If a child is not being fed or not being educated, school quality is diminished, that has substantial effects and should be, you should draw on the knowledge that you have, knowledge around the world, to show how important that is. Professor Luiz. É, eu queria já in, iniciar, uh, com a, a primeira pequena observação é que no Brasil, realmente, as taxas de escolarização aumentaram muito. Então, em certo sentido, os muito, muito jovens estão relativamente um pouco melhor. E, por outro lado, os aposentados estão bem, principalmente no setor público. Mas os, os adultos jovens que eu acho que perderam esse aumento de taxa de escolarização e também não estão aposentados, que esses que são os grandes é, prejudicados na atual distribuição de recursos públicos e esses que eu acho que ainda tem uma esperança de ser educado ainda porque eles são ainda 18, 19, 20 anos. Então, acho que o problema brasileiro é um pouco diferente assim, desse que você está descrevendo e eu acho que ele requer assim, um, um, um estudo específico sobre ele. A segunda é, observação que eu queria fazer é sobre... Você fez um estudo recentemente, até talvez é, falou é, pra, aqui no Congresso, quase, foi uma das propostas suas, falar aqui no nosso Congresso, nós organizamos, de avaliação de políticas sociais na América Latina, fez um estudo para o Banco Internacional de Desenvolvimento. Seria interessante, nas vésperas de eleições, saber um pouco desse resumo de quais foram os países mais bem-sucedidos 
nessa, nas suas políticas sociais. Uma vez, como o Ricardo falou, seria bom fazer uma avaliação de mais longo prazo, um estudo acadêmico mais sério. Mas no curto prazo, nós precisamos saber assim, aonde funcionam mais as políticas sociais na América Latina, de forma resumida. A terceira observação que eu queria fazer é devido ao lento avanço das minorias é, raciais no Brasil, é, é, recentemente tem sido propostas sistema de cotas para é, minorias raciais na, é, no ensino superior. E tem sido é, citado na imprensa brasileira e por vários políticos estudiosos do assunto, de que isso teria sido uma política bem sucedida nos Estados Unidos. Eu tenho certeza que você já estudou esse assunto e seria altamente elucidativo para o público brasileiro falar quais foram os resultados dessas políticas de cota, se elas foram bem sucedidas e se existem políticas alternativas para a melhoria ah, das minorias raciais no Brasil, que tem sido muito relegada, sem dúvida alguma. Você está referindo a affirmative action in education. Ah. This is a hotly debated subject in, the, in, in American society. There was a recent book by Bach and Bowen, one a former president of Harvard, one a former president of Princeton, looking at the impact of affirmative action policies on the performance of the uh, minorities in American society. Uh, two facts to keep in mind. Affirmative action, actually, in American politics, in American education, is really confined to only the top universities. So if you go to the ordinary school, the community college, you go to the, many of the public schools, there's absolutely no practice of affirmative action. In other words, the schools where the majority of American children are going, there's been almost no affirmative action. There's equal opportunity, but there's no quota system put in place. So it's only the top schools you see this quota system. So that's, that's important to recognize, and in fact, In many other, in many of the uh, poor uh, schools, if you want to think of it that way, or the less well-known schools, I shouldn't use the word poor, but some of the less famous schools, some of the state schools, what are called community college schools, there may be an over-representation of minorities, right? And so there's no quota needed. In fact, maybe the quota should be the other way. So the question then becomes, what is the long-run benefit of affirmative action? And it, it, it's very hotly debated. Now, there's no question about it that if you look at the Bach and Bowen study, that, that, the, that, uh, that the blacks, and uh, particularly we're talking about blacks and black males and black females, to a lesser extent, uh, uh, Spanish-American males uh, and females have been studied. You do see that there is a community of individuals who have actually benefited, and an apparent, apparently benefited, I should say, in the sense they go to Princeton, they go to Harvard, then they go on to graduate school, Yale Law School, Chicago Law School, some kind of... But the effects really aren't entirely clear. There's a whole affirmative action system. <laughs> so we don't know whether or not this is part of just a general chain. And the real issue has been how much has affirmative action elevated the mass of black Americans? And there, I think the answer is clear. What's happened is that affirmative action has had any effect. It's produced an elite group of black Americans who are more, maybe more highly educated from the top schools. It's had very little effect on the broad mass of black Americans. It's had very little effect on college educational attainment rates. In fact, one of the strangest phenomenon is that during this period of affirmative action in the U.S., between 1970 and 2000, the rate of attendance of black males going to college has actually gone down. Actually, it was more of, more of this going on, more college attendance in the 1970s than in the year 2000. And you ask, why is this happening? They, so affirmative action policies have not been able to effectively counter many other trends that are more basic, that account for disparity. And so I would argue that, now I'm not opposed to affirmative action, it has great symbolic value in the United States. On the other hand, the, the idea that affirmative action, which has been especially beneficial, to some of the wealthier members of the black society. So for example, uh, without mentioning names, some of the more prominent uh, beneficiaries of affirmative action have been black middle class children who have um, come from very privileged environments compared to what average environments would be for African Americans or for, or for uh, white Americans for that matter. And uh, 
it's natural. I mean, when you, you know, there is a certain complementarity that goes on in life. And that is if children start with early advantages, it's not surprising that affirmative action would typically select those individuals among the black population who already had some good initial advantages and might not have needed the push. So on the one hand, people have argued, yes, affirmative action has helped create a larger black middle class. But if you look at the effects after the 1960s, when blatant discrimination was eliminated, it's been very hard to see affirmative action in education and affirmative action in the workplace is having a substantial effect uh, compared to some other basic economic fundamentals like improving the quality of schooling, like uh, interventions in family life and so forth and so on that have made people adaptable to an equal opportunity system that was not favoring people on the basis of race. And then of course it's a very divisive policy to sort of pick out people on the basis of race. So I would argue that the that you know there's some symbolic value. The elevation in the black middle class, which has occurred in the U.S., more blacks in the middle class. I think very little of this has been due to affirmative action in education. I think it's been more due to just equal opportunity generally, allowing people to compete in the workplace. Maybe the imposition of civil rights policies early on when there was blatant discrimination. There's no doubt those policies worked. But after that period when laws of, you know, prohibiting people from employing blacks or, or, or providing punishments for people who employed blacks, when those laws were eliminated and society became open, then there was a very natural progression which has been taking place for 20, 30, 40 years where affirmative action has played a very, very minor role, at least affirmative action in schooling. So I don't think the American experience, the Bach and Bowen book is substantially flawed in its methodology. And to use the language of economists, they don't have a comparison group. <laughs> you, know, you have a group of blacks who went to these schools, you don't know what would have happened to other people uh, if they hadn't gone, and you don't really have an idea what happened to the whites who might have gone to those schools. So the, the studies are much less definitive than they're sometimes stated to be. Professor, eu agradeço muito a sua entrevista, nosso tempo acabou. É... Agradeço a participação de todos aqui no Roda Viva e para você que está em casa, nós vamos voltar na próxima segunda-feira, às 10h30 da noite. Uma ótima semana e até lá.